the Everglades is one of the world's most unique ecological treasures. It's not just valuable to Florida, but the entire world. There is diversity in the wildlife here that really can't be found anywhere else. But this beautiful historical land is in danger. Unfortunately, hundreds of years ago, this treasure was not valued as much as it is today. So going as far back as the 1880s, the system was extensively engineered uh, with a view towards making the land more habitable and to spur economic uh, growth throughout the region. Uh, what this has done over the course of time, uh, significant barriers to flow were put up and essentially uh, starved the Everglades of the water that it actually needs. For the native tribes that call this land home, it has drastically impacted their way of life. We've been going to Washington like every three or four months for the past five or six years. And here, we, we've been suing them at Federal Courthouse, the United States Courthouse, for the past 20 years. And this is nothing new. This goes on, on and on and on. That's why here you used, you used to have snakes, water snakes, your panthers, your bears, your bobcats, all over. Because when the water's high, they would migrate onto dry land. But they don't exist here no more because they're dead. They don't exist no more because they know better, because they know the water is polluted. Due to the mass development, the Everglades has become dangerously polluted. Scientists have found high levels of phosphorus and mercury. This is just the beginning of the water problems for the state of Florida. If you live in Miami or Fort Lauderdale or the Palm Beaches, um, your drinking water comes from the Everglades. Uh, basically, the water that gets to the Everglades goes down through the limestone rock, it goes into the Biscayne Aquifer. It's only a few hundred feet deep and it has to be replenished all the time because we're, we're taking water out of there for millions of people. What we're trying to do is all this water we're dumping to the estuaries, the Everglades doesn't have enough water right now. It needs it for its own ecology, it needs it for the Biscayne Aquifer to stay fresh. And so we're trying to put a million acre feet of Okeechobee water back into the Everglades, which is going to help the Everglades and make them wet and make them the wonderful wetland paradise that they used to be. It's also going to recharge the aquifers down there, and it's going to be the best thing that we could do for drinking water supply in the future for the Lower East Coast. And to see legislators down there saying, oh, we're not sure we like this project, and it's like, guys, we're, we're, we're helping build your water, your water supply future. We haven't yet had to be victims of the water wars, as they're called, and that, that folks in northern parts of Florida are seeing, where they're debating about water supply with Georgia and Alabama. And it's because we have this abundant supply that's recharged every year by the Everglades. And if the Everglades was completely drained or totally altered, that supply wouldn't be there anymore. And we'd be needing to find a, a different source of water supply to use every day. And of course, water is one of the most important things for, for everyone in, in their daily lives and in their health and their viability. For so long, man has used the Everglades to create an economy and for the growth of agricultural and industrial land development. Many are looking for answers on how the Everglades got into the condition it's in. And knowing the levels of toxins three times what they're supposed to be relative to the uh, Water Protection Act and what have you, that big business is certainly a major contributor in this. And it's time to stop blaming the citizens who have a very small blame in this and start to start, uh, it's time to start looking at the larger interests who for 80 years have had free reign to use Florida as a big giant septic tank. If you go down 27, you look to your right, you get to like, uh, 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 when you get close to South Bay, you see a whole bunch of uh, field on that side. It was started back in when Gov Governor Chris was still in office to make uh, reservoirs there to clean the water from the polluted sugar cane, from the cattle, from citrus, pump the water there and then release it. But Governor, uh, Governor Chris then worked a deal with the sugarcane, bought about 80,000 acres or something from, uh, from, from, from that company and just abandoned it. There's no question that agriculture uh, creates quite a bit of phosphorus and pollution. Uh, I, I, I think that the sugar companies have recognized that over time. Uh, I know that they're uh, their managing practices have changed dramatically uh, their, uh, to minimize pollution. I think they've come a long way. So I think we've all learned a lot and I think the state of Florida has, has uh, taken a lot of the, the
the water that flows uh, through agricultural areas and now with all these pretreatment areas where we're, we've come a long way. But there is hope. With the comprehensive Everglades restoration plan in place, the ultimate goal is to provide the Everglades with clean, fresh water in the right place at the right time. I think the most important thing is that we stay focused and continue the progress on Everglades restoration. We've, we have a number of projects, such as Tammy and Me Trail bridging, that will help remove a, a barrier to sheet flow and allow water to flow naturally. We have projects like the Picayune Strand over in southwest Florida, where 55,000 acres of habitat that's been used by panthers and other very very critically endangered wildlife has now been, is now being restored and that project is nearly complete. So we need to make sure we're finishing these things that are that are underway but that we're also keeping our eye on what what's next to come. What are the next things that we need to make sure we are doing to reconnect the natural flow of the Everglades. So my viewpoints as a commissioner is that you can't draw lines in the mud out there and everything's for just one uh, area. You have to keep a global viewpoint of the global Everglades. Otherwise, it's a trickle-down effect of destroying the Everglades over time. There may be minor impacts in different areas for the global benefit, and then we will succeed in saving one of the natural wonders of the whole world. I always say, clean the water. Do not flush it down the river, dirty. That's all we're doing. If, if, if everybody did their job, this, this Everglades and this environment would be a whole lot better place. It'd be better for your grandchildren and their children because pretty soon they're not going to uh, cost you, but maybe a little bottle of water costs you a dollar. It costs you maybe $10, maybe 10 years from now. To find out more information on Everglades restoration or to find out how you could help, visit evergladesplan.org or contact Autobahn Florida at 305-371-6399. We can't afford to lose this precious ecological treasure.